Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction. It's, uh, yeah, it's a complex uh, title. I also stumbled across it. Um, but first of all, um, yeah, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing this great conference. I, I really wish I had the had had the opportunity to attend it um, at the start of my PhD some two years ago. Um, yeah, because there was already uh, many great talks, great input. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I come from the environmental sciences and um, we deal with the estimation of parameters for the distributed models. And for that, we have developed a Fortran library, which um, yeah, is generally attempting to apply context-free grammar to hierarchically organized and variably shaped arrays. And in my talk, I would like to introduce the, the scientific concept behind that and then show some uh, Fortran implementation details. Um, yeah, so before I dive into the, the scientific background of my talk, I would like to give some feedback on, on my group. So um, we were founded some 10 years ago and have been uh, working with Fortran um, ever since, uh, mainly with uh, model development. And currently we have um, yeah, some projects going on where we try to parallelize our existing code base with uh, hybrid open and GMPI um, parallelization. We also need to establish a unit testing framework for our, yeah, for our legacy code and that's um, taking some resources but also we are trying to look into build optimization of CMake and continuous integration and so on. Um, yeah, we mostly have a scientific and uh, also engineering background, but not really from the computer sciences in many cases. Um, yeah, so what is our daily um, business, so to say? We try to conceptualize uh, processes, we observe nature into equations. And here on the right, you can see a scheme of the hydrologic model MHM, which is uh, developed our, uh, our department and it will serve as an example here to demonstrate a problem of parameter estimation for distributed models. So this model is basically um, describing the, the water balance on the land surface um, denoted by a change in the storage um, which is uh, the difference between precipitation, evapotranspiration and the runoff and more specifically um, we have certain storages here for example the canopy storage I picked out as an example um, and yeah, storage is dominated by processes, uh, precipitation, evapotranspiration, and also um, um, through fall flux. And how, for example, is this flux calculated in the model? Um, just as an example here, um, yeah, it depends on the precipitation, the previous amount of storage in this, this canopy layer, and then um, also a parameter uh, dominating basically the flux. And um, yeah, now it's uh, obvious if you want to um, yeah, run a simulation with the model, you need to come up with a parameter. And um, this is some task we have to do. Um, we usually don't do it for a near 1D column, but we are interested in spatial patterns in, in the landscape. And for this, we, for example, here, we need to estimate parameters for 12 different model cells. Um, yeah, usually there are no measurements or observations available, so we have to come up uh, with a value with the different, uh, different methods. So we can uh, use basically constant values. We can also um, derive uh, the, the values based on an auxiliary data set, for example, land cover, and then map the different values to each land cover type, for example, through a lookup table. Um, we can also employ inverse methods. Um, calibration, for example, is um, performed at subdomains for which observations or measurements are available. And um, yeah, by changing the parameter values, um, we can then inversely change the model output to match the reference data. Um, yet sometimes we do not have information for all our domains, so we need to uh, run a calibration only on a subdomain. Um, or sometimes, it, or most often, it requires many computational resources, so a calibration is not feasible to run on every uh, subgrid. Um, so the parameters can also be derived based on uh, proximity measures, um, so the neighboring cells are, are used, um, or also on the auxiliary data set like band cover again, so they are mapped by these other features, um, or by any other internal features of the, the basin itself. Um, but then again, um, parameters can also be estimated by uh, regression functions, uh, which are performed on some predictive variables. And here, for example, land cover and leaf area index, which is a common vegetation parameter, um, are used uh, with uh, a transfer function. This can be 
basically a, a function of any kind, uh, from a linear function to um, also some machine learning based approaches. Um, and yeah, this is a function uses also some uh, parameters uh, here denoted gamma, and they can also be uh, subject to calibration again. But the main difference is that the calibration uh, would here only access the parameters of this transfer function. Um, so, for example, yeah, they, are, they were limited in number and not the, directly the, the beta parameters. And basically, this overview of different parameter estimation methods is um, common today, and they are used in state-of-the-art models. Um, and I will now show you some, some real-world applications. So, the example model here, MHM, it doesn't require only one parameter, but 28. So for our toy layout, this would already mean uh, I lost here. Oh, yeah, okay, I had some problems connecting. Um, so it would mean almost 400 parameters, and that um, number, of course, increases uh, if we go to bigger domains and uh, higher resolutions. And currently, um, yeah, we are working on a project where um, uh, these pictures don't load. Sorry, I'm experiencing some troubles here. Yeah, so currently we um, um, yeah, we work on a project where we try to um, run the model at a high resolution on a global scale at a 0 0.1 degree, and um, these parameters cannot be uh, inferred by calibration um, techniques. Um, yeah. So, here's the map. I think you see it now. It took a long time to load, maybe that's uh, because of the high resolution uh, of this plot. Um, yeah, maybe I can also turn off my, my video. Yeah, the presentation will continue. I'm really sorry for the inconvenience, inconvenience here, yeah. Okay, that worked. I think we're now back on track. Yeah. So this is um, here a comparison of different state-of-the-art um, land surface models that basically all uh, have the task of um, yeah, estimating different parts of the, the water cycle. And um, those um, models are conceptually very different, but they also share, for example, a parameter um, describing how much water a soil can potentially retain the soil porosity. And you would assume that this parameter is relatively similar over all the models, but before you wonder the color bars and also the scale of each map there, they're the same. And you see that there's a multitude of different patterns and they are often even contradictory. So we really have a problem that each model does the parameter estimation in a different way and we would need to come up with some harmonization approach. So this is where this um, uh, parameter estimation concept that uh, colleagues of mine developed comes into play. Um, it's called the parameter, multi-scale parameter regionalization approach. And it basically does what I've previously shown you. It uses some predictor variables, um, what's in a, a transfer function, and then derives the, um, the parameter field. Um, and this is done at a high resolution of the uh, predictor fields. And then in the second step of that method, um, these um, parameters are upscaled to the, the target resolution of the, the model because they are usually not run at these high resolutions. And for that, a second upscaling step is, um, is necessary. And yeah, this approach has the advantage that, does it, that it minimizes the aggregation error as it first calculates the parameter and then aggregates. And not the other way around, which is very common also in other approaches. Um, and now this scheme was so far hard-coded in this model code of this MHM model, in, which is of course in Fortran. And um, yeah, now we want to port this, um, this parameter estimation approach to other models um, so they, that they can also benefit from, from this scheme. Um, so um, I would like to show you what uh, an example configuration would look like. Again, the example here first 
application of a transfer function, then upscaling and rewrite the parameter fields. Um, and the current implementation is all fits into a relatively slim name list, um, as you see here on the right. Um, I will now highlight the most relevant parts of that name list. And yeah, if you keep that scheme now in mind with the, the predictor variables in blue and the um, resulting um, parameters uh, in red, you can construct such a complex um, hierarchical independency graph. And it shows all the parameters uh, needed for the MHM model. Um, and each of the uh, edges between the nodes is either a transfer function or an upscaling operator, or sometimes also both. And yeah, now the task was uh, for, for my PGT project also to um, turn that into a standalone library uh, in Fortran. And now, how did I do it? Um, it has some specifications um, for, for different requirements. So we want to have a standalone executable. We want to be also very flexible in coupling to other, mostly Fortran models, um, uh, other land surface models, um, have a flexible API. And we will also um, try to have a, a very flexible scheme in allowing for, for different transfer functions. Um, yeah, the usability has to be uh, very high, and so that users will also adapt it. So we need few depend dependencies, simple configuration. We mainly rely on the NetCDF4 for file format, which is common in climate sciences. And um, yeah, as you've seen, most of the um, arrays, um, they are reused. They are um, uh, used in a couple, couple of times in a hierarchical structure. So object orientation is also um, the way to go. Um, yeah, some features of the current implementation as, as it is now in its um, almost final uh, state. Um, yeah, we have implemented a first order conservative remapping scheme for different type of grids. Um, like this mostly concerns uh, at least uh, two dimensional grids. Um, yeah, we have also implemented a coordinate specific uh, aggregation function so that you're flexible in uh, having different aggregation schemes over, for example, spatial and uh, horizontal and vertical dimensions. Um, we also have a remapping of irregular shapes, as you see here. And then again, some yeah, basic uh, array multiplications like broadcasting, splitting, uh, concatenation, and transposing. Um, and now I would like to go a bit more into detail when it comes to the transfer function implementation. So we again take this uh, example here uh, from the previous slides. And how would now uh, like the Fortran code look like to have that? In the most specific and easiest way, we have a, just an elemental function here, um, which accepts um, different um, arguments, first the two predictor variables and then these uh, parameters. Um, but then does, this implementation would not meet all the requirements we have. Um, because the predictors, they can have different ranks. Okay, this uh, implementation would fulfill that actually. But then we also, would need to support different types, although float um, or real um, is the most common um, logical or integers also uh, do exist for predictors. Um, some of the transfer functions users um, will, will use are not elemental, um, e.g. that you use like um, the neighboring element information, like a ranking or accumulated density function, for example. Um, and of course, it would be good to have a common interface for all the, the transfer functions. Um, so, um, yeah, an alternative implementation would then um, also pick up some of the, the concepts uh, discussed in these earlier talks today, like the generic programming, um, so that we have a type for a data array and for a parameter. And um, yeah, we then have a, a 1D array of these uh, derived types. Um, for, the, for the function, and we can initialize it or we can call that in, in such a way. Um, this would now um, have the benefit to um, yeah, uh, allow different types as they are then packed into these real 1D arrays uh, in this data array type. And um, yeah, uh, we also can have different um, non elemental 
um, functions there. But then we have the problem, um, how do we get that uh, into the Fortran code? Because only this information, which transfer function to apply is uh, available at runtime. And for that, um, yeah, we wrote a little um, a preprocessor in Python, which um, evaluates the, the name list and then, um, yeah, writes some automated Fortran code. And um, yeah, this, this implementation is not really ideal. Um, because it's also based on a simple string and search replace operations. Um, and it, um, yeah, it also um, has the, the downside that this real conversion might not be even be necessary. So templating might be a, an option to go. Um, we can also um, not really have a different or a grammar analysis. Um, and it's also um, not available at runtime in Fortran. But then again, as I said, there were many different talks that also touch these problems that I have with this implementation. For example, the, the talk from yesterday, the EIS2 code um, or library, that is, I think, uh, um, an avenue that I can take forward. Um, yeah, so this leads me to my open tasks. Um, we need to also have a more sophisticated remapping library using different regrading methods. Um, the performance needs to be improved because um, yeah, parallelization was not yet really um, um, addressed uh, in the development so far. Uh, unit testing needs to be improved. And um, yeah, the code is currently not, not yet available as we first uh, want to have it published in a scientific uh, journal. And yeah, this finally leads me to my uh, summary. So the task was um, to um, develop a, a library that performs our um, uh, transfer functions in the upscaling, um, which is uh, which we call the MPR framework. Um, we want to have a simple, flexible, and uh, modular setup. And yeah, as I said, the code development is still ongoing, but um, yeah, we plan to publish it in the next month or the next two months. And yeah, it, um, it's already uh, really um, implemented in another project where we work together with the European Weather Agency, CMWF, and we um, yeah, try to uh, couple uh, this NPR approach to their um, land surface model. And um, yeah, so it will really find a way into the um, applied sciences, so to say. Yeah, and with that, I would like to thank you. Thank you, Robert. So we have time for one, maybe two quick questions. So the first one is how the dependency graph is built? Was the library used? Um, yeah, it's basically um, a graphless uh, implementation. So um, this checks this uh, configuration file, this nameless file, and then comes up with this uh, tree or with this dependency graph. Thanks. And the last question would be can MPR handle? Uh, multi-shaped grids like the grid of a football with pentagons and hexagons? Um, yeah, usually it um, relies on this NetCF file format and then all these um, uh, different um, yeah, tiles, so to say, pentagons, hexagon, they are then just yeah, packed into a list so in, in the end they are a, a 1D uh, array. Um, but that can be handled. Okay, then Another question. Uh, so, Thomas Koenig, you would be scared to fit so many parameters. So, how do you access, assess the error bounds plus covariance and the effect on the model results? Um, so, the concern is the amount of parameters. Um, did I get it right? But you overfit, probably. Or... Yes. Yeah, so, um, MPR is basically intended to regularize the parameter space, so not to be, uh, not in the end to have to uh, optimize the effective model parameters, but only these parameters of the transfer function. And um, yeah, so this is uh, already an improvement. Um, uh, yeah, when it comes to the number of parameters to be optimized, and um, yeah, through different. Um, uh, schemes, you can also uh, capture the, the uncertainty and, and parameters when you um, yeah, apply certain thresholds and, and, and yeah. Good. Thank you, Robert.